All right, we're going to welcome everybody back. Uh, for most of you know me, but for those that don't, my name is John Hartmeyer. I'm with a contracting company, John Shko, and I do some other various things. And I've been involved in various radio and TV stations throughout the years in Ohio. Um, I'm a member of the Ohio Broadcasting Technology Committee Conference Planning Committee. And our next breakout session, titled Delivering Power Over Data Cable, will be presented by Ron Kasuma. He is the Senior Product Development Engineer for Belden. Since 2013, Roy has been specializing in CAT 6A as well as Power Over Ethernet product design and research. He's been developing high efficiency products and solutions in process. He has published numerous white papers and industry guidelines. He also serves as a member of the TIA TR42 BICSI and NFPA with contributions relating to development of code and standards for the structured cabling industry. We're pleased to have Roy here with us today to talk about the changing POE standards, Belden Labs POE, testing results for different cables, and how connectivity impacts performance. Please welcome Roy. Thank you. So yeah, uh, today I'll be talking about power over data cabling. It's a bit of a generic term right now. Uh, most of the time when we talk about this, it's PoE related. But as of right now, we have at least five standards that uses power over data cabling and many more to come because uh, a lot of people are not wanting to wait for the IEEE standards to get finished um, uh, before getting more power over the data cables that we have today. So effectively, power over data cabling as we define it is just delivering power and data over the same transmission line. It's a single cable. You could power your IP telephones, um, cameras. Uh, so far, a lot of the basic infrastructure like that. Um, but as the things progresses, we expect that these applications to, to get a lot more sophisticated and be a part of our uh, more direct infrastructure in our um, building, trucks, and everything like that. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, this was a market research data from Bizria uh, that does a lot of research on the building industry. And they researched or they got a survey from a lot of the building systems integrators and specifiers and how many of them have actually installed devices in these categories uh, in the last 12 months. And I have been doing POE research for quite a while now and I've expected uh, wireless access point, access control, VOIP, that's, that's nothing new. But what really surprised me was the things that they're mentioning like laptops, which I presume is more thin client based uh, type of devices, LED lighting, digital signage. Um, these aren't necessarily things that we anticipated to have already happened, but the fact that these guys are already installing it, um, they're going through various protocols outside of PoE uh, in order to get this done. And it's exciting that people are you know, trying to get their hands into this technology um, as quickly as possible. So as you can see, there's a variety of different applications and this is kind of just the beginning. And once the IEEE standard gets published, uh, we expect that this is going to become more mainstream and more manufacturers are gonna put these um, applications um, readily available in the commercial market as opposed to having to um, f find a way to get uh, to these devices. Additionally, they also um, asked all these survey takers uh, whether or not PoE is going to replace AC power in their infrastructure. Um, a good portion of them don't know, but a very large portion, about two-thirds of the survey uh, surveyees, are saying that it's going to be either replacing um, a sub or up some time of even um, mentioned that it's going to completely supplant AC power in some various portions of their infrastructure. So that's very exciting for me to see. Um, I feel that POE and power over data cable is a very efficient way to wire your infrastructure. So uh, th there's a lot of pressure on this entire industry to kind of get this moving at this point in time. So 
Kind of as I mentioned before, PoE is the crux of power over data cables. It's, it's something that started it all for power over data cables, but it started in 2003 or so. It was very, very low power at the time. It was 15.4 watts. Um, a lot of the legacy applications stem from that limitation. So we can see basic access points, uh, basic cameras, or the vast majority of IP telephones using the lower end standards. And as time went by, we got higher standards. In 2009, we got a 30 watt standard. But even 30 watts is kind of right in between where you could really use uh, more sophisticated applications. So IEEE has been at the 802.3BT development for, I would say, about the last five to six years now. And as I mentioned before, a lot of people got impatient waiting and they develop their own um, protocols. But effectively, in 2018, we finalized the standard for BT, allowing up to 100 watts in power using um, data cables. And we're anticipating the completion or the publication of this standard by February of next year. So once that's published, again, people can commercialize all their products using this uh, protocol that's heavily vetted and safe. Um, so we expect a lot more uptake in applications. So we're hoping that people are going to start converging and create devices that doesn't require AC power or any other power of kind uh, when it's something that you expect to be con constantly connected to the network. So we're thinking sensors, temperature gauges, anything that's in the building that might be permanent, even televisions, to be using data cables to power, signal, control, and all having access to the network without bearing load on your wireless infrastructure or any other infrastructure that you may want to dedicate to, say, your uh, computers, your laptops, your smartphone devices where you have an active data connection. And so this becomes a more infrastructure-like um, application. Uh, in the digital building space, we can expect that, uh, as you can see, wired LAN and wireless is nothing new. But we also like that AV and the collaboration infrastructure is going to be added into the data cabling infrastructure. Uh, building management, lighting, and life safety and physical security. Effectively, again, kind of highlighting that data cabling can be used now or in the very near future to supplant a lot of the um, infrastructure-like uh, applications. So we could replace uh, regular switches, uh, or light switches, power receptacles, uh, access points, and things like that to something that's always connected to the network as opposed to having temperature gauges that might take a look at your, or raise or lower your drapes as, uh, as, the, as the sun uh, comes and uh, changes direction. Um, instead of having that battery powered connected to your wireless, having that as a part of the building infrastructure permanently. So one of the things that was really nice about this whole thing was there was some synergy in the growth of the application, the cabling, and everything that goes around it. Uh, since 2000, we've had continuous growth in wireless speeds. And so from BGN, AC, and now AX, or Wi-Fi 6 as we call it now, um, it started from 11 megs per second to now touting 10 gigabit per second wireless speeds. Uh, and of course, the infrastructure, the backhaul infrastructure required to support those applications um, have been evolving as they come by. So the category 5E, 6, and 6A cabling that is required to provide that kind of bandwidth is now available while these in, uh, infrastructures are developing. Um, additionally, there's that green portion over there that is kind of under the radar for the most part, but now that four pair PoE then a 100 watt PoE is coming to life that we can expect um, kind of a more of a convergence in applications and usability beyond just the access points and the uh, IP cameras and telephones. So one of the things that kind of came out uh, a little bit more relevant to the broadcast industry um, is HD-based T. 
It is a pro it's a it's a protocol that effectively replaces HDMI or it's an extension of HDMI that allows you to use data cabling to power signal uh, have USB uh, control systems as well as uh, have internet access to these devices all on a single cable. So for example, um, actually that projector would most likely be able to be powered using a single data cable instead of having your power cord, uh, whatever HDMI connection I'm using, whatever source, and it's all available in your IP network. So in terms of deployment in like stadiums or control rooms or um, various locations that require various screens, it would simplify your operations, it would simplify your um, installation costs to just use a single cable to manage um, all of your applications. Uh, this standard also somewhat came about as, uh, as a push to step a little bit away from the IP protocol world and uh, try to get the 100 watt power prior to the IEEE standards being finalized. So now that IEEE is getting really close to finalization, um, we're expecting that this either get rolled into the IEEE standards or have, um, have it grow in a separate direction. So technically power over HDBase-T, the 100 watt that they push prior to the IEEE protocol coming out is power over HDBase-T. It is um, compatible with the lower end IEEE protocols of PoE the 802.3AT and 802.3AF. It's uh, low voltage, uh, the same as the IEEE protocols, and it, the only difference really is that it's using a different protocol and that it has a different maximum current level. It's one amps per pair. So uh, it's, it provides a theoretical maximum of 100 watts. Uh, it is interoperable with PoE. Again, the, the lower standards, we're still trying to see how that's going to look like with the new PoE 802.3BT standards, especially the four-pair 100-watt uh, standard, and whether or not HDBase-T will drop that and just uh, supplant it with the PoE standard as more universal. But effectively, it's just another example of how people are getting excited about the 100-watt uh, power over data cables and trying to push it prior to the IEEE standard being finalized. Um, there's also one other alternative to HDBase-T right now to provide video over the data cables alongside power. It's uh, SDVOE. It's basically software-defined uh, video over Ethernet. Uh, this uses a more standard IP infrastructure. So you could combine this data transmission of videos um, through your current IT infrastructure using IP protocols, whereas HDBase-T requires its own separate system and network that you'd have to wire up. So, I mean, that's, that's all great. I think um, we're all very excited that there's gonna be new applications in uh, the data world. It's gonna be replacing a lot or simplifying a lot of our deployments uh, long-term with uh, infrastructure, but there is one unfortunate thing with all this um, the desire or this increased application is we're anticipating a lot more drops of cable uh, at any given infrastructure. So more cables tend to mean more problems. Um, if you can see, this is just an example of uh, one of the installs that we had not too long ago, and that's already um, close to a thousand cables right coming out of that one main aisleway. Um, and if you think about it, uh, if you take just a cross section of it, uh, you would see this bundling effect uh, where all the cables are really compressed together and are able to emit noise and heat and they're just going to affect one another. So two things that are really bad for data cabling that has always been known but now amplified with the uh, increased application is alien uh, crosstalk effects or alien noise effects where these cables are transmitting signals of a very similar frequency to each other and so they would tend to couple from one cable to another. So you have to make sure that uh, provisions are taken to ensure that your data infrastructure is reliable not during installation, but during peak hours. So when your stadiums are running with all the different um, cameras signaling everything going at the same time, you have to make sure that you stress test that infrastructure to ensure that that's capable of handling at peak loads. 
The other thing that kind of came out of this uh, power over data cabling development is heating effects. We're pushing as much of a power that we could do within the safe legal limits of cabling, but the cables still do heat up. And as you all would imagine, um, more power means more heat. Uh, as long as your resistance is there, you're just going to generate more heat. And when you combine all these cables together, this, the heating is somewhat substantial on something as sensitive as data cabling. So this is how I like to kind of simplify a data transmission. Um, this, top, this top line is how much loss you have. If you've ever seen a data cable uh, chart when you're taking a look at a data sheet, there's this thing called insertion loss. It's effectively how much loss you have in your signal from one end to the other. Um, and it's also affected by some other things, but primarily it's uh, attenuation. That's the attenuation line. The bottom line is noise immunity. Uh, it could be characterized as near-end crosstalk, far-end crosstalk, or any external noise source like alien cable-to-cable um, -cable, uh, noise sources. And then the bandwidth is how high of a frequency the cable is able to handle. So category 5E cable can handle 100, uh, 100 megahertz. Cat 6 tends to be able to do 250. And then cat 6A could do 500. So the area bounded by these three things is effectively how much information you could effectively send reliably in, um, in your data cable. Uh, and this, this is actually also known as the signal to noise ratio. If you have a cable that could go higher in bandwidth or higher in frequency, and of course you have more room to play with, if you have a cable with a higher attenuation or lower here on the chart, then you have less headroom to play with. And the same thing with noise. The more susceptible your cable is to noise, the lower that whole um, signal to noise ratio threshold would be. So, the best thing that you could do is to actually just spec in as high of an SNR cable that you could handle, um, give it within reason of your infrastructure and what you're trying to do, and whether or not that information capacity is going to be suitable at a peak load to do what you want it to do. If you need a 10 gigabit data transmission, then you have to ensure that that information capacity is sufficient. So um, some of the other in, uh, information here is return loss. That that throws a little bit of a monkey wrench to the signal power. If you have cable with poor return loss, that signal power is not going to be consistent throughout. So you're going to have certain frequencies that you're going to have uh, poor transmission in. And then better near and crosstalk means that your lower your noise immunity within cable as well as between cables are going to be significantly lower. So again, giving you more headroom to, uh, to play with in your application. So how this kind of applies to powering is when the cables heat up, the resistance get higher. And so your attenuation will significantly drop as your temperature goes up. And that could be based on ambient temperature or because of cable heating if you're powering all your applications at the same time in a bundle. So again, this kind of stresses the importance of stress testing your infrastructure to make sure that you're not going to have critical components drop out uh, when you really need it the most, when you're using all your applications at the same time. So that's that whole portion here is kind of what we've all been dealing with for the last 10, 15, 20 years of data cabling. But now that we're also considering powering efficiencies, uh, we have to take a look at um, just overall um, efficiencies of your devices, uh, because now it's all being powered by your data cabling. So as you can imagine, uh, the higher your, or the larger your conductor diameter would be, or the, the more copper you have in your conductors, the lower your resistance. And so you have less of an efficiency drop, the higher your power is. Um, especially because all these um, powering applications are now DC power. So you cannot handle too long of a length without losing too much efficiency. So temp higher temperature is going to increase your DCR. Your uh, larger conductor is going to decrease your DCR. So you'd want to make sure that those two things are criteria that you look into when you specify 
um, power over data cabling. So the difference between, say, a 26 gauge cable and a 22 gauge cable is very substantial. So you really want to minimize the amount of cordage that you have that is um, of a very small copper diameter because you're going to lose a lot of your power efficiency uh, if you use a long length of, say, a 26 gauge patch cord or spec in a 24 gauge cable when you have the option to do a 23 gauge category 6A cable or 6 cable, that's going to give you significantly more efficiency around this level, especially at the higher power levels. So you can imagine operating costs if you're if you're transitioning most of your applications in a building, your building operating cost is going to transition predominantly to these PoE applications. So if you're using cabling that is less efficient, then effectively you're going to pay more in um, electricity bills and maintenance bills. Um, I was actually at a Big C conference about a year, a year and a half ago, and somebody from Sinclair Holdings had kind of push their way into having POE infrastructure in the vast majority of his building. And he was touting about a 30 to 40% efficiency improvement from going from AC to DC, uh, just because his, uh, there's no conversion losses with your power bricks and things like that, but also your installation fees are also a lot more efficient. But given that the majority of his uh, infrastructure is now running on POE, uh, these efficiencies are going to add up the majority of your operating costs of your building. So again, stressing how important it is to uh, basically go with the best that you can for the applications that is very critical to your operations. Um, TIA is the Telecommunications Industry Association. They basically define the world that I live in. So all of category cabling, what are the performance requirements, what are the installation guidelines, things like that. They have also put out a TSB, a service bulletin, effectively guidance on how to install uh, power over data cables uh, as efficiently uh, as possible, up to 100 watts. So some of the key highlights about that is they tend to recommend the limitation of bundle sizes. So you don't want to put all that cable on the same tray given possible, uh, whenever possible or separate them even if they are within the same tray, separate them into various different little bundles so that they could have a little bit more efficiencies in the same infrastructure. The other thing is um, they, they guide that you don't want to go above 15 degrees in temperature rise because that's kind of when the integrity of your data signal is starting to get um, in unreliable, especially when you test that cable, when you spec it in, you test it in an indi individual cable at a time, and the 15 degree ambient temperature just gives you that extra headroom where they're comfortable with, with that infrastructure. So you could, you could follow this, you could follow um, a stress testing environment if you could have capability to do that in your buildings when you specify it as well. So a lot of considerations is there when you have power over data cabling. So this is kind of an example of what they recommend. It's um, instead of one big bundle, try to minimize it and separate them as much as you can. You could have, uh, you could reduce the heating by up to 25% just by splitting that one large bundle into the three smaller bundles. And again, reduce your liability and risk of your infrastructure not working at peak times. So, Given that this is all very important, we also have one other thing to consider. Um, the National Electric Code in 2017 added provisions that you're not allowed to uh, bundle your cables uh, above a certain size depending on the temperature rating of your cable, the gauge size of your cable, as well as how much current you're going to use in that infrastructure. So it's all a little bit complicated, unfortunately but it is now uh, part of the National Electric Code and as long as your state is, um, as long as your state is adopting the 2017 National Electric Code, you will have to comply with this bundling requirements uh, as long as your application is above 60 watts, which a lot of POE is going to be in the future. Given the complexity of that table and somewhat unfeasibility of bundling everything throughout the entire way, 
Uh, UL has created a new listing for your cables. It's something that you could look out for in your cable prints. Uh, it's called an LP listing. Effectively, it allows you to bypass that entire table altogether as long as that cable ha meets the, the stringent test requirements that UL has set forth for high power PoE. So again, if you are deploying a very large number of cables or in a large infrastructure, it is worth considering uh, to get rid of that headache and just go with a cable that's LP rated so that you don't have to have a bundling requirement. However, the data transmission aspects still apply. So uh, the, the recommendations that TIA set for is still valid. But in terms of a life safety, in terms of compliance to building infrastructure and code, this is uh, probably the easiest way to ensure that your infrastructure is compliant to inspection. So to kind of sum it up, more demand means more cabling and more considerations. Um, we have to consider the cable data transmission effects and reliability. We have to uh, consider the cable heating and its implications in code and life safety as well as um, trying to make the whole systems or infrastructure design simple, um, we recommend going with the highest end or the, the, a higher category cable than necessary in order for uh, reliability um, in your infrastructure. So the recommendations are effectively to anticipate the power over data cabling uptake. It's going to, I'm hoping, that it's going to really change the way we think about buildings and infrastructure and how things are going to be connected to our uh, local network and also our internet network as well. Um, the right cables can and will yield different efficiencies and reliability. So please bear that in mind when you're doing a large, large infrastructure uh, or are going to use large infrastructures at an event, for example. Um, consider the bundling effects on noise and heat and there's a lot of things that you could do to minimize that in an installation and pathways methodology uh, as well as future proofing by provisioning more drops in applications given um, most people put one or two drops a room uh, it might not be a bad idea for you to consider uh, that to be the new um, power receptacle so more people are going to use that data network um, plug uh, a lot more than in the past. Um, and finally, just apply installation methods that uh, support your solution. Uh, of course, we're not going to, as much as future proofing is fantastic, it typically adds more money. So if you know that you don't need high power PoE for certain wings or certain areas of the building, then potentially you could um, design per your system requirements there but then in more of the dense spaces where a lot of people are going to be in that area um, develop the the best that you can to future proof that region so um, I think that's kind of it so uh, I shall uh, open it up to questions I suppose yeah Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure. So uh, the question was whether or not there's new connectors that can handle 100 watts, as well as whether or not uh, powering over data cables could handle data and power simultaneously. So uh, I'll, I'll tackle the second one first. Uh, yes, the effectively PoE is kind of nice on data cabling because, or power over data cables is all effectively superimposing a DC power signal over um, a, a signaling. So kind of like an AC signal to some extent. It's not really AC, it's just data. But all, you all you're doing is you're elevating by a certain DC power that zeros and ones that you're looking at. So it gets, tra uh, you put a transformer on one side, raise that power level to, to that power level, and on the other side, you have a reverse transformer that pulls that power out, but maintains the integrity of the signal that's being transmitted. So it's it's a full duplex uh, data transmission, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't interfere. All it does is just change the the, the magnitudes of them. Um, with regards with a uh, hundred watt capable connectors, the nice thing about IEEE and the way they do their standards is they focus a lot on uh, backwards compatibility. So in theory, 
we could technically get by with a category 5e cable even though it's very inefficient it will still work if you have like a single end-to-end -end, uh, one application solution but the considerations really come in when it's uh, a large infrastructure uh, so there is something to be said about good connector designs though because the unmating the act of unmating under load at higher power will cause arcs and a lot of the better connector manufacturers these days have a separate contact point uh, where the, the jack rests and where it unmates. So the arcing will still happen, but it's, uh, it's arcing on a, on a sacrificial section that doesn't matter during your, uh, during your application. So think of it as uh, having about this long of a connector. You're arcing this portion when you, when, when you disengage or engage the, the, the cable under load. Uh, and then the, the portion that is maintaining contact when it's engaged fully is over here. So um, there is that reliability aspects there. Yes? Okay, so the question is uh, basically whether or not this comply with the NEC and how it's going to handle the power if it's, uh, if it's, if you're going higher in power, whether or not it goes up a class or not. So effectively, this is still class two power. It is still, class two power goes up to 100 watts max. So that, that 100 watt limit is not necessarily arbitrary, but it's also to comply with the class two requirements where it's still all low voltage. Um, meaning that you don't need, uh, say, like a licensed electrician to, to do these drops. Um, additionally, the 100 watts is being obtained by increased current, not by increased voltage. So it's still a, 50, a roughly 50 volt, depending on which uh, application. It's roughly a 50 volt application. And so the, the thing that we changed a lot was the current per conductor as well as how many, how many pairs are being used to power. So the initial stages of POE was using only two pairs. Now we're using all four pairs in that full duplexing methodology, um, as well as the, um, the increased overall current per conductor gives you more power per pair. Um, and we're able to get to 100 watts without um, effectively breaching class two applications. There is talks out there about um, separating each individual pair or two pairs to separate circuits, technically allowing you to go to four pairs, but the implement, uh, sorry, 400 watts, but that implementation is a lot more complex and nobody has successfully done that yet um, within the allowance of the National Electric Code and uh, UL. But the theoretical possibility is there. It technically, yes, a lot of that is handled by the five, the physical layers. Uh, that's kind of why it's always nice to wait for IEEE to finalize their protocol so that it's, everybody's implementation of it is standardized. So you could have the interoperability between um, different devices and different standards. But effectively, yes, uh, you have a certain portion of the cable, be it in each individual conductor or each individual pair acting as the live and the other acting as the, it's a neutral. Right now, you sort of have to look up what the manufacturer is intending. You're getting a POE box or something, so you get the right one. Correct. Well, the, the good thing about, uh, again, following a standard is as long as you could see that in that application or if that device is POE compliant, then you know that they're following that standard that you're not going to have an issue with your, your system. So I, I'm always a fan of following the standards given the, given the opportunity. Yep. This is also increasing new, new design on switches and things that are network POE. Yes. Uh, so one of the things that was a big... Uh, issue initially or a big cost of debate initially was uh, how big is your power supply going to be on each uh, switch? 
Um, but in the end, towards the end, each one of them, each manufacturer, Cisco, Huawei, all these guys, they're coming up with their own solutions to uh, safely power each of these to, uh, to do 100 watts on each port, effectively. It's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting undertaking, but uh, there's also this thing called digital electricity is also going to play into that. But that's a whole separate subject. <laughs> yes. Uh, the the I guess the both data and power benefit from having uh, lower attenuation. So you have more signal that received on the other end. Uh, if you look at the SNR triangle, uh, you have more signal received at the other end with lower resistance or lower attenuation. So both the data and the powering aspects benefit from a larger gauge size and lower attenuation cabling. Yes? That, that's a fair point. Uh, be careful about just snipping off the back of a server. But at the same time, uh, again, one of the beautiful things about IEEE is that's a very serious consideration when they develop a standard. Uh, there is safety cutoff switches. So as soon as anything arcs, or as soon as anything uh, shorts, uh, there's an automatic shutdown procedure that should protect you um, prior to any shock happening. Should. <laughs> <laughs> You'll fill a nip, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. So you talk about the standards, and um, is this like the standard, or it's still in development, or are there like parallel like systems and standards that are being developed as well? It's kind of see hmm. which, which system kind of. So, for the most part, it's applications ba based. So, HD base T and SDVOE is more on the video transmission side. Um, but I expect that going forward, it should all converge together or be interoperable with each other. Um, and the primary protocol for all of IP, all of PoE, has always been IEEE based. So, uh, I would anticipate that everything's going to default back to that. And then there's going to be these other standards if you have specialized applications that you could superimpose on top of that. But uh, I think as things go into the future, interoper interoperability being a very critical to uh, this industry, the, st the structured cabling as well, um, that's, going to, uh, that's going to be very, very uh, the, the, the de facto uh, standard used. And that's, again, that's been finalized. Thank goodness it's, we've been fighting for years over that. Um, but we're expecting that to be published by February. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Special thanks to Roy for uh, speaking today. And uh, there's going to be a recording of this session along with the presentation. It'll be on the uh, engineering section of the website, OIB website.